Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're assembled here tonight on a little film show which is put together for the purpose of, of a segment in a film that these people are making of my life. I've been associated with this business for about 60 years and in that time I've met a lot of friends and uh, haven't made any enemies, I must admit, but uh, I've had a lot of friends and there's a lot of people uh, learnt quite a bit and I've learnt a lot from them. But the object here tonight is to, uh, is to add this little assembly to the film that is already being made. And uh, you'll notice that the camera is set up here and we've got lights set up there so that whatever is done here tonight will be shown or seen on the film and possibly be shown on TV. So you might have a geek at that, eh? <laughs> <laughs> By the time we get a few shots here of what's going on and showing a few films, the night will be gone. So without any further ado, we will switch on to the... Out of the light, Gary. Victorian Film Productions present The Shattered Illusion. Director A.G. Harbrow. Photography by Reg Robinson. Assistant Director R. Clark Harrison. In the dance sequence, <coughs> the leader of the band failed to show up, being sick or actually had the flu on this occasion. And uh, me being a violinist, I said to the director, uh, you turn the camera while I lead the band and as a result of this we were able to get the sequence which we would have not been able to do otherwise. This one here is taken at Moore's place in Turak, a mansion that he, he threw open to us for, for this photography. Now that's Harbrow. Uh, with this other chap taking this old chap down <coughs> to the old hooker and they take him aboard of course with the idea of fanning him and uh, uh, the result is that we never had artificial lights in those days and we had to rely on sunlight to get the effect that we desired therefore we waited till the sun got low in the sky and for the, the sun rays to come right through and strike the other side past the candle and the table as you can see they asked me to play another part in this film and uh, as captain, oh there I am on the screen at the present time. Uh, we took this chap up the gangplank and uh, took him aboard and we decided to give him a job in the, in the stoke hole. This is a scene we took in the backyard at Abbotsford and uh, it was a stoke hole scene and it was done on a rocking stage similar to what a, uh, uh, a rocking chair would be to give the effect of a rolling ship. Now this is the, uh, the scene uh, with the model working. It's also taken in the backyard and we had a, a lot of trouble w trying to get this sequence for the simple reason that we never had a camera suitable to speed up to 128 frames. Herschels were the only people that had one and we hired that. Well, we had all the necessary equipment such as uh, smoke, aeroplane propellers and the tank and all that sort of thing and the model. But once the camera was got up to speed uh, with three turns, it would jam, right? Everything had to be stopped and uh, uh, the film was pulled out, pulled out all over the yard and uh, uh, another try was made. Well, during the afternoon, it took us all the afternoon to get a, a, a few feet of about 50 to 60 feet which we had to use in the film. And it's interesting to note, as you can see on the screen there now, that the uh, backgrounds which should have been covered by smoke was bare, more or less bare, for the simple reason that there was, there was no smoke left by the time we got to the, uh, the last of the film. In making this film, everybody cooperated to the fullest extent they used to come not only on the weekends but nightly to discuss the making of this film, to put in their few bob to buy film. Everybody contributed because we only had very limited sources and uh, we had to wait from week to week to buy a, a 400 foot roll of film. And we had to have the, the few pence from each and every one to be able to buy it. 
On the night that we shot this uh, sequence where he is uh, uh, lying on the beach, uh, you can see on the screen there, you can see the leaves and the aeroplane engine was running and the water was being poured on in, in abundance and it was a really cold night to do this. And uh, he, he looked like nothing on earth being photographed there and uh, believe me, I wouldn't have been there for quids. <laughs> Well, the principal shareholder in this film, of course, was Ma Daly, who had put a fair bit of money into it, and Harbrow, who was the director, of course, he, he was uh, more or less uh, always pinpricking between the two of them. There was a lot of argument and all that sort of thing. And from my own point of view, I had a bit of a disagreement with him uh, when we were making a, a film a little later than that called Tall Timbers. One of the actors was using a motor car of mine and he smashed it up. And as a result of that, we had a meeting and I said, that's it, I'm finished with it. So I pulled out of the whole uh, situation and it's like the small boy with his football. If you can't be captain, you take your football and you go home. That's what I did and that was the end of picture making as far as I was concerned with that syndicate. Now there's a nice shot. He's thinking about it and he gets his memory back here. This is the girl that he really loves. Poor old Gret, killed in a motor smash. She was? Yeah, she's killed in a motor smash, this girl. clips. This isn't the uh, bit of the model of the boat, is it? There was another no, no, I haven't got any clips of the model of the boat. Uh, here we are, film clips from The Shattered Illusion, 1926, director A.G. Harbrow, cameraman R.J.T. Robinson, film now in the possession of the National Film Trust, Canberra. That's a negative shot of the uh, of a clip from the boardroom scene. That's me behind the camera and the director, A.G. Harbrow, who is dead now. And the star in that, of course, was a girl by the name of Gret Wiseman, who was later killed in a motor smash. And Jimmy Aiken, who, who, who was the leading man, he was an Englishman. But uh, that's taken at Point Leo. That was in 1926. Now that, that's the camera that I built to do this film, The Shattered Illusion. That, that is a reconstructed Numa Sinclair and I made the tripod myself out of sewing machine parts. Can you see that? This, this movement is one of the first to be built here. Get it out here. Not many damn things in here to get into. But it is the forerunner, forerunner of what you see here today. Now there's the movement. I don't know whether you can see it there, Pete, but uh, I will. that is the 70 millimeter. So it won't even turn because all the parts the roller races and that have been disconnected, but that gives you some idea of the movement, see? 70 millimetres wide. The Fearless Company of Hollywood had built uh, 70 millimetre cameras, but the, the, the uh, organisations, the big studios, never went on with it for the simple reason that uh, there wasn't the market and there wasn't the equipment around the world to, to screen 70 millimetre stuff at that time. But since, of course, as we know now, they have 70 millimetre equipment. That was done from 1930 to 1932. The government cinematographer, Bert Ives, who was a friend of mine, uh, wanted me, he'd made up, uh, he'd mocked up a, a wooden movement similar to a Mitchell, similar to a Mitchell, mocked it up and he wanted me to make a, a movement similar to that. Well, I had a machine shop at the time and I made this movement for him. 
all cameras in those days were hand turned. Now to get a lap dissolve, they would have to use a, an iris on the front of the camera, which is seen on the front of this camera. And uh, Bert Ives had the knack of, uh, of being able to make a lap dissolve uh, while the camera was panning. Now, I saw a film that he took in Tasmania. Uh, when it was screened, you couldn't tell where the lap dissolve started and you couldn't tell where it finished as far as smoothness is concerned. It was perfect all the way. These photographers could get something out of nothing. He was at my place in 1938, a matter of a fortnight or three weeks before he died. So he said to me, look, Reg, he said, if you go out to my place in High Street, Paran, he said, and pick up that IMO, he said, bring it home here because he said, I want you to, to make a little unit to go onto it. Well, now, Bert was a very heavy smoker, and as a result, he got lung cancer, developed pneumonia, and he was dead in a matter of a few days. Quite ironical because he, he, was, a, he was one of uh, the motion pictures original uh, first class cameramen. I would have loved to have been in that, in that field but never had the opportunity because f uh, jobs in those days for this sort of thing were so guarded that uh, there was no hope of an outsider breaking in. No hope at all because they were so jealously guarded by those that were in them. I was originally a bus driver with a private company before the tramway started operating buses at all. And when they did, they selected 14 men from the various companies that existed in those days and joined uh, the nucleus of the tramway's staff. Well then, from there on, I'd become an officer, a conductor, a driver, electric driver, bus driver, depot starter, inspector, bus instructor, school instructor, and uh, finished up as a school instructor in charge of North Fitzroy Bus Training School. And how's it going? Well, give it a trial. Give it Still a trial. Well, oh, there she is, boys. She's rolling. Totaling all, 41 years. Still as good as ever. Good as ever. Carrier Still as good, good as ever. ever. We've also been a cable gripman, and uh, there's quite a few stories attached to the old cable system uh, with the things that happened in those days and the way that we had to negotiate traffic with prehistoric braking methods and all those sort of things. What, what, what was the height of the bridge? Nine foot six, the, the bus is 14 nine. 14 rod. <laughs> Jerry's booking up with his, he's, he's got glasses on, he's booking up here and uh, all of a sudden he looks up and he sees the bridge coming at him. <laughs> at the bridge coming at him and so he flops straight down and misses. He, he got out of that lot right. and smashed the, all the front of the bus in. Yeah, the, the, top, the deck top deck went back to the stairs. Yeah, back to the stairs. Stupid yeah, back to the stairs. Yeah. He was lucky because he, lucky. Would have, he, he probably would have been killed if he hadn't have dropped yeah, down as he did, you know. He would have. the days. 
Yes, we didn't want anybody to go out and pinch a couple of cameras. Come in, come in, come in. Come on in. Come, come on, on, come on here. Come on. Oh, I've got to get my kiss. Come on. How are you? <laughs> How are you? Yeah. Thanks. How are we going, right? Yeah. That's the girl. Yeah. You right there? Yeah. Your, your daughter's got a microphone hooked up to her too. Yeah. You want a seat, love? Yes, you sit down there, mate. Hey, come around here, love. Oh, yeah. You gonna have a cup of tea or do you have a cup of gin? Yeah. Well, now, as I told, are you right, Gary? Oh, oh. oh there's somebody else there. Can you see, love? Oh, you can have some. Oh, well, that'll be probably Angus with oh. his projector. Yeah. Good on you, boy. Well, there we are. <laughs> Yeah. How are you doing, mate? Yeah, they wouldn't look at you if they put me in the picture. <laughs> Isn't that right, Peter? <laughs> yeah. That's right. Now listen, before we finish in here, we'll just get a bit of... Come on, Phil. You, love, you come in here in the middle. Sit down. There, there. there you are, right next to you. Oh, there. Uh, take your hat off, will you? Oh, no, no, she just... No. Yeah, it's all right, she just come in. Off. All right, leave it on then. If, the, if the producers don't mind. No, don't mind. Just one little bit and then away we run, eh? Yeah, well now, a little closer, Phil. Right. Can you get that in yeah, on 12 mil? 12 mil? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 go on. Go on the back here, Angus. Just <laughs> sit down a little bit, Angus, so you yeah. can get it on 12 mil. Well, Angus here, of course, is one of our family friends, and uh, he's it's been so It's the first time I've seen him. How do you do? I've seen you on film. Have you? <laughs> yeah. There you are. You yeah. see? Oh, well, we're all on it now. That just, was just, just. That was bad times. Yeah. If we went over to, if we went over to Smith Street, Collingwood, and we bought the ring two quid. <laughs> you remember? <laughs> all the secrets coming out. So, so yeah. we saw, we saw yeah. a beautiful little blue hat there. So we thought that would be lovely as a, as a, as a hat for the wedding. Yes, yeah. that's right. <laughs> oh, so you went and got it, did you? So, yeah. Oh yes, we got it, and we start to pay all furniture at ten bob a week. Didn't yeah. we? Yeah. <laughs> Long history on the camera. Yeah, did you have similar experiences? Yes, for sure. I was married the, well, just before the Depression. You played around when I was a kid up on the fourth floor. Marvellous, isn't it, eh? How the time flies. Well, I'd say the wife, well, here's Ted. Ted's come mm. around now. I wonder what we can do today. But The, the only time I ever won up at his place, uh, uh, well, after the deal was over, his wife would give me a cup of tea. That's all <laughs> I got out of it. I'll never forget, Ted, that, that 35 millimetre machine we had. Do you remember? I think I got it when first. You told me it yeah, it on fire yeah, in the middle of the shop. Uh, yeah, in the middle of the German <laughs> shop here, yeah. Oh, so that, that, that was a <laughs> <laughs> You said to me, oh, well, I think 35 millimetre will go here, all right? <laughs> <laughs> all right, it went up in smoke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not bad, eh? Yeah. Yes. Oh, what a wreck. We yes. Had, we had 36 <laughs> full truck loads go to the tip. <laughs> Frank was a real old rubbish gatherer, but in, uh, during those times, Billy, he, uh, he gathered a lot of good stuff. I'll tell you what, uh, I had a lot of film at that time, and uh, I thought to myself, well, as time Reggie, you got rid of it. I, I had some beautiful stuff. That's right. You, you wouldn't believe this, but somebody brought a copy of Gone with the Wind to me. That's sad. And I said, no, I said, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't have that in the place. I said, that uh, I, you, that would have to be pinched. That would have to be pinched. I yeah, said, gone with the wind. Yeah. But there was one reel missing out of it, and that's where that's where um, the father jumps over the fence and is killed, you know, oh, in, yeah, in, yeah. in the in the story. But, uh, look, I'd have given my right arm to have had that film, but I, I said, no, no that's, that's stolen stuff. I wouldn't have anything yeah. to do with that at all. Yeah. But uh, where I am now, there's no room, Bill. That's right. There's no room to do anything. Yes, well, they're the sort of things that we have here. It's only a very small... Uh, when I was in the city, I had a, uh, a theatre there, which I had plenty of room. But when I came in and bought this place out here, I had toyed with the idea of building a theatre uh, right across the, the back section of this property. But uh, oh, I thought I was getting a bit too old, so I decided not to do it. So this is the result. It was the sleep out and when I brought, had a look over the place first I thought well that'll do me. I'll put all my film gear in this uh, in this den as I called it then and uh, uh, we've been here ever since and I think that uh, we'll be here till the last day. Right, if you like. right, on, right. We'll just move down to the garage where we keep our our uh, process. <laughs> Well now we move from the den down to the laboratory which is uh, situated in the garage 
more space, very little space, but we establish a few things down here. So, oops, <coughs> amazing. Well, now we move to the garage where I'll show you a bit of, uh, of the equipment. Watch these step. Uh, things are a little confined here, but uh, if you come in, we'll show you where we... The, uh, this is what I've used as a uh, film processing plant. We process our film here through the aid of hand method and uh, it takes a gallon of solutions, both the developer and uh, fixer and hardener and all that sort of thing. From there, of course, we transfer it to the drum and uh, that dries also the 200 feet. Then you can get going on the second 100 feet. We have done a lot of colour from time to time, but I don't do colour anymore because it's not an automatic idea. We have here a little, a little uh, 30 feet uh, bath here, which is quite easy to manipulate, move out, and uh, and the whole thing when we when we're washing, we just pick it up and and uh, put the whole thing out, so that uh, all the tests, uh, short film strips are made there and. Uh, when they're, when they're satisfactory, after the film is uh, printed, it's transferred to this drum and dried accordingly. You had to do all sorts of jobs. I've even done assisting with a bag on at the various football grounds. But I wouldn't do anything off the rails, uh, things like that. No, no, I've always disciplined myself to... Uh, we're just finishing about a 20 feet of film, huh? Is he a stern fellow, do you think? Uh, no, underneath the countenance. <laughs> underneath the countenance, we're very soft, aren't we? Yeah, very soft. It's the hard dial that really makes it, uh, everything seem severe and stern. It's a very soft dial. <laughs> One day, uh, we had to pick up a, uh, a driver who was uh, who had uh, a skin full, as the saying is. And uh, he was that bad that he could hardly walk, so I said to my sub-instructor at the time, I said, all right, Fred, we'll go and put him to bed. So, so we uh, took him home, which he, he lived close, but not far from the depot, took him home, took his uniform on, off, took all his clothes off and got him into bed and thought he was asleep. Before we got into the car and had gone very far, we had another little job to do before we went back to the depot. But when we get back to the depot, we find the fellow there in full regalia, uniform and cap and everything on, back there instead of being in bed, he's down at the depot making a nuisance of himself again. Naturally, we didn't put him to bed the second time, but uh, we sent, sent him packing and of course a report had to be made. My face uh, depicts uh, a man who is stern and for that, uh, the traffic manager at one time wanted me to take the, dis the discipline officer's job. I said, no, I don't I uh, wouldn't care for that, for the simple reason that uh, I don't like hearing cases of people who are in in straitened circumstances and trouble in the home and broken homes and all that sort of thing and finally have to sack these people. I don't like that sort of thing. Although that was almost the second highest paid job in the tramways service. But I rejected that job and I'm glad I did. As a matter of fact, when it was offered to me, I couldn't sleep for a fortnight, so I uh, finally rejected it and I'm very pleased that I did. Tucker. Okay. Why have you got a big cup? Oh, well, I have two of those, and that does me. I should hope so. <laughs> it's enormous. You can't beat it, son. When you get to my age, you'll appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> I know what we wanted to ask, Reg. What's that? The story. The bop and the light. Of you when you uh, first started driving the car, when you were about 12 or 13. Yeah, oh, yes. Remember yeah. it Yeah, we were in Kalgoorlie. Oh yes, oh yes. Yeah, the kitchen? Yeah, that's right. Uh, so I used to, at that time, I used to work for a, uh, a grocer. And getting 30 bob a week on the cart wasn't very good for me, so uh, th this uh, old mine manager had advertised for a driver. So uh, before I started work that very morning, I uh, blew out to uh, the Twin City Boulder, three miles away, and... Uh, uh, knocked at the back door and the old chap come and he said uh, I said I've come in, in answer to the advertisement for a driver so anyhow he said can you drive son I said yes I can drive so he said all right well there's the car over there an old 1911 or 1910 Studi Baker so he said there she is over there in the yard he said uh, bring her over here to the tap and wash her while I finish me breakfast really I said all right so I get over into this damn thing and uh, I couldn't find a gear. I didn't know one gear from the from the other. Anyhow, I was sort of burring around. First of all, I had to start it up, and they had those old cone clutches in those days, 
and I started the thing up, finally got it going, and was uh, r rolling around the gearbox looking for a gear, so I finally got into a gear, it must have been third, I think, because I went hell for skeleton towards the towards this, uh, this uh, kitchenette that he was having his breakfast in, so I saw this tap there, and she crashed, bang, into the blimmin' tap, and, and she hit the wall. So, oh, God, I thought, what are we going to do now? So I, <laughs> I jumped out of the blooming car and, oh no, first of all I, I somehow found reverse gear and I reversed the damn thing back and uh, jumped out quick and lively and the tap was pushed right over near the wall and was leaking so I got hold of the tap and pulled it up straight and just as I pulled it up straight he, he come out and he said, uh, uh, you having any trouble son? I said, no, uh, uh, that's as close as I can get to the tap Mr Smith. <laughs> When I come back over here, and I drove from, from 1914 to 1917 for this old mine manager, and uh, when I come over here uh, to Victoria, uh, he swore that nobody would drive this car after I'd left, so he'd, he started to drive it himself, and uh, he was bringing a load of passengers from Boulder to Kalgoorlie, and uh, didn't see a tram that was running out of the car barn. And as a result of that, the, he hit this tram and uh, and was killed as the result. I don't know whether there was anybody else ca killed, but uh, a friend of my mother's wrote and told us that that Smith had been killed on the following Saturday night or the Saturday uh, night after that I, we'd left. I've got about a thousand feet of 16 millimeter film that I intend to take on this trip to Perth and around the Western Australia. Not only to Perth, but we're going up to Geraldton, down to uh, Albany, Bunbury, Esperance, back onto the Nullarbors again, and Mildura and all around the place. The daughter and son-in-law whom we're going with, uh, they've got camera equipment as well, so that between the lot of us there'll be a lot of film taken one way and another. I had a very poor education. As a matter of fact, when I left school, I only reached the third standard. I had a lot of sickness when I was young, broken arms, typhoid fever, because the West was such a hot place that uh, we used to swim in dams with cyanide water in them. And uh, used to keep our mouths shut so that we wouldn't get a mouthful of this stuff. We'd go and swim in dams where there would be cattle. Which cattle were very scarce, admittedly, but where they drink the cyanide water and were laying dead alongside the vats, wherever it was, and yet we would swim in them. I've swum in dams which were green, were green, and as a result of that, I got typhoid fever, which almost killed me. I worked in the mines from 15 to 16 and a half, and that was enough for me, I tell you. To, the mine managers used to say, well, look, Reg, you're only a boy, but we've got to pay you a man's wages. If you can't do the work, we've got to put you off and put a man on. That was the attitude of the mine managers in those days because it was heartbreaking work. The miners, uh, when they come off shift uh, at, the, at their working level, which may be 2,300 feet down, are searched at the bottom level. Then they return to the 2,000 foot level and they're searched again. They come up to the thousand foot level and they're searched again. And then they come to the top and are searched again. Now to beat it, they would put a slice in their behind with a knife or a razor and press the gold into that and suffer the pain till they got clear of the mine and, and then remove it. Then secondly, if it wasn't too big, they would swallow it and take a packet of salts next day and recover it. So I missed all the main part of my schooling. Never regret that. No, I never regret it. I never liked school. I never, like Thomas Edison, I never liked school and uh, I don't think school, schooling done me much good at all. But when I joined the tramways and become an officer, I became a very good writer, a very good figurer, and what I didn't learn at school I made up through the aid of a working livelihood. I didn't know anything about decimals, trigonometry, 
or any of the necessities to manufacture a thing like this. construction of these professional cameras, it was necessary to devise some means of, of getting a suitable fading shutter. Now this mock-up, although it's very dirty and dusty, has been up in the, in the workshop there for years and years, gives some idea of how the thing would work installed in a camera. By using a lever at the back, that shutter will close right down and it should lock. But, uh, and by the same token, it will keep revolving concerning the whole issue, you see? And when the shutter is wide open, it still revolves, but you can close the shutter half down and it still revolves in its, in its original uh, idea. So that was the first unit that had to be constructed to see if it was workable before these cameras were started or even the drawings got to any stage, and long before patterns were made. Righto. From the rough casting, of course, we get a, the finished article. I cast 12 camera bodies and 12 of everything concerning the camera first. Then I found that the finish and the modelling wasn't to my satisfaction, so I recast after arranging with the aeronautical supply for Air Force piston material, which gives the finish you see on the camera now. I've been working in this workshop uh, approximately 20 years, but um, when i done the uh, big cameras or the professional cameras, the large ones, I use lathes up to 20 inch. This mechanism is made up of a double system perforation, two pull down claws and two registration pins. One registration pin uh, locates top and bottom and the other registration pin locates on either side, so you've got double registration both up and down and also sideways. And the first job that this camera that done for the PMG was to go around Australia looking into and photographing all the post offices that were being eaten by white ants. They sent me an invitation to come to the screenings as they thought that some of the film that was photographed there was quite remarkable. The cameraman, Les Hendy, he photographed a white ant on a edge of a file. Now, the screen down at the, at the theatre was uh, approximately 12 foot by 10, something like that. And this close-up of this ant, this white ant, actually filled right across this 12 foot screen. And the grooves in the file looked like huge ravines. 
spread right across the screen. And the report said that this camera was either the work of a genius or a madman. Now that was a great compliment paid by these people. This is the main aperture plate, can you see that? That's the main aperture plate which can be taken out for cleaning at the, as I've done it without tools. You've got that, haven't you? Yep. That's the plate. Now to remove, there's two little triggers there, that one and that one at the bottom. They're just pushed down and the movement comes out in your hand like this. There's the movement. Beautiful bit of work. You getting that? The locking of the uh, of the film onto onto the uh, the sprocket is done by eccentric means. There you can see when that is pressed down, it clicks into position, and the film is locked and it can't escape. When the magazines are being closed, the, it, this unit is turned like that, and those throats there in the magazine now are locked. So to open them, all they can do is flick that like that, and they're open, ready for action. 1,200 foot magazines are used, uh, also 400 feet, but these are 1200s and uh, they have inside a unit which comes out like that. That is a, a unit which goes goes over the, the whole thing and uh, is driven by that method, you see. Around on this side, I can get around there, which I think I can, we have the fading shutter that shutter is faded out from 170th degrees down to naught, and we open up the shutter again to open. The shutter can be closed at any of those points. That's 170th, it's, it's uh, open. It's three quarter open at 120th, half open at 60th, quarter open at 40th, and entirely closed down at naught. Now when the camera is racked over for, for focusing, it is brought across on what they call the rack-over principle and the, the telescope there is looking now right through the lens and uh, you sight through, through the lens from this area. Then when you finish focusing, you, it, it racks back to its position for shooting. Those professional cameras there, although they were a financial failure, I consider that they are something really out of the box. It's just like a jeweler in his watches. He regards it as a work of art, and I think that is a work of art uh, in making those things. After a few setbacks in 1950, I decided to, to seek employment and give this idea of uh, manufacturing these things away. So I went back to the tramways, and of course you had to take whatever job was offered, and I took a job with the tramways board as a clerk in the roster room. As I said before, I would like that, that camera to go to the museum because I don't think a camera like that will ever be made in this country again. I murdered 26 years of service and as a result I had to more or less start from scratch. I should have come out of the tramways board with, with, uh, with something like, uh, by today's standards, I should have come out with about uh, oh, eight to ten thousand dollars. Instead I come out with three thousand dollars. See, that made the difference. So what I, the few bob that was in the camera making business, uh, they say you, you gather it on the merry-go-round and lose, lose it on the Asian wave. So that's what happened to me concerning those, those days. Uh, in many parts of my life, I've done a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, drawing. I'm not an expert at, in drawing, but I've done a lot of it from time to time, even in animation work. And... Uh, and uh, figuring of all descriptions, which helped me a lot in my tramway career. Um, in 1940, uh, the proprietors of Picture News had decided to do an article on me, and um, we have some of the some of the stuff right here. Animation was the thing, but uh, I had a chap in with me on this animation side, and I don't know, although I can draw fairly well, the animation side was a little bit difficult from my point of view, and we, both of us, used to lose the figure in the way of animation. But uh, we had, to, had a go at that, and uh, I used to do, as you can see, all the photography, and uh, there are some of my drawings that you see there. Uh, just before I finally retired from the tramways, the, uh, I <coughs> made application to the board to have a new schoolroom uh, adopted which was close to the old schoolroom 
and uh, in the in the request in the request I wanted uh, six blackboards. Now these blackboards were finally agreed to by the management, and I said, well. I will uh, naturally put most of the instruction to drivers on these boards so that all comers from here on would be able to, to uh, lecture from these boards and give the same lecture to all and sundry among drivers and trainees alike. Well now these boards were done in chalk and uh, <coughs> the sub-instructor was continually sharpening chalk for me for about uh, oh, the best part of a fortnight that the board would have supplied us with all the chalk that we, we needed, but I was running backwards and forwards at the shop getting packets chalk, of chalk yeah, all the yeah, time, yeah. and it was my job, every few letters that Reg put off on the boards, uh, the um, chalk would go blunt, and he said, yeah. right, sharp me up another yeah. one, and I, I'm, that's all I was doing, <laughs> sharpening chalks all the time, from one to the, all different colours. Yeah, all different colours. We got the idea of the colours from uh, when I was at the police driving school, uh, their blackboards are done in chalk and in different colours, and that highlights the, yeah. the, the different... Um, uh, they must be sharp, the chalks must be sharp, if they're not sharp you won't get a letter like that's on those boards now. So we're busily, uh, busily working on these uh, blackboards and we're up in the corner one there and the traffic manager walks in and he said you busy? Yeah, busy as bees <laughs> we reckon. <laughs> the chalk figuring on these blackboards is kept uh, to this day and, uh, and they were done eight years ago. The only discrepancy is that the the pink chalks have faded to white but the blackboards are kept intact and nobody's allowed to go near them with a cloth or of any description to deface them in any way. Uh, when they painted the school out recently, he tells me that uh, he guarded those black boys with his life because once a, a smudge was put near them, they would be damaged. We had to make sure that every word was spelled correctly. That's we, right. We couldn't yeah. have a word Spot spelt right, yeah. wrong because uh, we'd have copped it from the... Although there was, was one word spelt wrong. Yes, yes. Because the student was sitting at the... He thing picked it out, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> and it, we had uh, vandalism spelt wrong and he said to me, uh, Mr Smith, there's no R in vandalism. And I said, my word, you're right too. <laughs> so then uh, this was after you had gone. Yeah, that's right. So uh, I thought, well, now I'll have to do the yeah. best I can. Yeah. So I uh, tried to limit the yeah, vandalism. It's hard to pick it. Yes. You'll see it over there. Yes. Well, we had V-A-N-D-A-L-I-S-M. -D oh, it's V-A-N-D-A-L-I-S-M. We must have slipped there. So... Uh, uh, this student picked it up quick and uh, believe me, he was a foreigner too. Yeah. That picked it up. It was Seems strange to say, and all our English bloke, Australian blokes sitting at the they never picked it up. Never picked it up, eh? They let it go, apparently. Yeah, he said, yeah. there's no R in vandalism, Mr. Smith. And I said, no, you're right, there yeah. isn't. I woke up as soon as he said it. During, during the period he was in Shangi Camp, or just prior to it, when the Japs were seizing them, he said, the, 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 the uh, atrocities that the Japs carried out, he said, was sickening. He said, do you know, he said, they just grabbed a baby from, from, from uh, one of the Singaporeans or whoever it was, throw it up in the air and catch it on the end of a bayonet. They used to do this repeatedly. And this, this got under his skin. So when, he, when they, he was released in 1945, as a matter of fact, I took four buses down to onto the uh, Port Melbourne Pier under direction from the tramways board and the uh, and the military authorities at that time and uh, and picked them up including sister bullwinkle who was supposed to have been shot by the japanese she was on that ship too and uh, then we took them to uh, heidelberg uh, military hospital where they were all checked in and, and checked over and all that sort of thing and within a within a few weeks he was back on the job as sub instructor now he used to We'd have our lunch together in the schoolroom, and he'd tell me all these stories. And then, all of a sudden, he, he saw a, a job advertised up at Stall to look after a fleet of, of semi-trailers and uh, trucks and that for, ha for a housing firm that was building houses. See, so he went up there and tried to get a few more of the, of the instructors down there to join him, but they wouldn't. But he went up there on his own, and he wasn't up there very long when he, uh, when he uh, became a councillor in the Stall Shire. Became a councillor, and, uh, and he had a daughter by this time, and, uh, and one of the streets was named after her. Anyhow, 
the next part of the story is that uh, he uh, used to go out to this Mount William, as they called it, and they uh, used to cut the wood and uh, they'd load up the timber and stuff and bring it into the saws and all that sort of thing. One day, in 1956, one day, we read an article in the, in the, in the, uh, in the local paper here that Mr. of Stall, Councillor of Stall, went out to Mount William in his car, closed up all the windows, put the, put the hose out of the, from the engine exhaust into the, into the unit, lay, lay into the interior of the car, lay down on the back seat and committed suicide. He told me, he told me many times when we were talking in the schoolroom after he would come back, he said, oh, look Reggie, he said, since this war, he said, I don't know where I am. He said, one day, he said, the wife gave me some money to get down to the, down to the, the, the fruiterers down, just down a couple of, a couple of streets down, he said, he said, I got on a tram and went to the city. He said, we do, I said, I don't know, when I come home late at night, he said, he said, I don't know where I went or why I went, he said, she said, where have you been? He said, I don't know. He said, I just, just been around. He said, here I am home. But that's, his memory had gone, and uh, as a result of these war atrocities that I referred to, he said, the diabolical things that the Japs did, which was, which it, the day I witnessed, he said, was terrible. Since television, since television entered the field about uh, not quite 17 years ago, uh, we've always stopped home and we've always looked at TV. That's as far as we've gone regarding the picture business or going out to see a show. We have gone on one or two occasions to see Gone with the Wind and uh, we've seen that several times. And this last version, of course, we saw that and there was another thing there made uh, on location in Switzerland, I think, I'll just forget the name of it, but they're the only two times that we've been out to a, to a picture show since. Yeah, right. Australia's two love, they got a very good chance now of winning. Who was the who was the other contestant? You know, oh, yeah. Labor was it? Labor, yes, and, uh, and Newcomb. Johnny knew John Newcomb. He won oh, the yes. first lot, and Labor won the second. Yeah. And uh, they got a very good chance of winning there. Yes. Well, they're the two singles. The yeah. doubles are to be played yet. The wife and I have always uh, looked after our health, in as much that uh, we consistently take Epsom salts daily throughout the year and every year. The object of that of course is that the wife uh, gets the uh, Epsom salts and uh, puts them in a basin, pours boiling water on them and yeah. uh, dissolves them and they become concentrated. So each morning in a glass of warm water we put two teaspoonsfuls of this concentrated salts and also a pinch of cruising salts which, which accounts for the health that we've enjoyed all these years. Uh, I'll tell you who it came from. It came from a man named Mortimer, who lives at Garden Vale. He's still alive, but he's yeah. a very elderly gentleman now. Go on, eh? One of the most enthusiastic studio people. Go on, eh? And, yes, the, and yes. the, the tricking past about this one is about 18 months ago, he, when he was very sick, he said, I better get rid of my photographic gear. And I bought all these photographic gear for him. Yes. Uh, then when he gets better, he says, can you get rid of it? So I said, oh, yes. Well, I said, it's too good to get rid of. That's a really a, a relic. Yes, that's and then, right. And then he tells me the story about the plate holders, which we sold to somebody else. Yes. So that, now we've got a camera without plate holders. That's, how, did, how did you come to sell the plate holders? Did they because fit some it, other type of yeah, camera? Yeah, there was another camera very similar in size. Oh, I see. But yes. we did, didn't want them. Quite a unique type of thing. It's made in France, of course. And, uh, well, they're nearly all made in France, all these. Uh, yes, yeah, so this would be, uh, I suppose, this would be one of the first uh, uh, transparent film pack uh, types of things used. Well, yeah, it wasn't really a film pack because they loaded a plate up. See, they used a piece of film yes, like that. That's uh, what you asked it was you printed that photograph. That's a paper. negative. Yes, it's quite interesting. Uh, of stereo. Well, I've had a fair bit to do with stereo cameras. As you know, your agent for Viewmasters here for quite a long That's time. That's right. Yeah. And. Uh, uh, I've had Viewmaster cameras for many, many years. Here we have a, quite a, a collection of Viewmaster stereos, which, as I've said many times, we can travel around the world. That's about as far as ever I'll get from, uh, from London right away back to here to the, to the South Pacific. So that uh, any time you feel like a world trip, you can uh, just get out your Viewmasters and uh, follow them through, and I'm sure that it's much cheaper doing it that way. As you know, by closing one eye, we only get two dimensions. 
But once the, once the second eye is opened, we have the third dimension, which leads anybody to believe that we mu there must be some preconceived idea of giving that uh, extra dimension to human beings, or for that matter, to all animals, birds and all alike. Oh, I think there's some preconceived being that, that is uh, masterminded all these things. Uh, some years ago, I decided to make uh, a stool for low filming. So this thing was made up for the object of doing a film on trees. And I thought over this for a few years, and I thought, well, I'd like to make this little film. And as a result, I... Uh, I designed this thing and made it up. It's uh, quite a handy little stool, and to, to film at low levels, uh, it is a very necessary adjunct. The film was made entirely of trees, and the song that was to go through it, of course, was sung by Paul Robeson. I've always been fascinated or interested in making short musicals in costume dress particularly with well-known ditties, such as uh, songs my mother taught me. But this little stool actually made it much easier when the filming took place. And quite compact and easy to carry. I think that I shall never see Poem lovely as a tree, a tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against the earth's sweet flowing breast, a tree that looks at God. Go. Cool. 